Hi, thanks for joining us today at Data Ops Unleashed. My name is Jordan Tagani. I'm the Chief Product Officer at Single Store. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Single Store, uh, we provide an ultra fast modern cloud database designed for the data intensive era. We can do both transactions and analytics uh, at speed in the same, in the same database. Uh, joining me today is Mike DePrizio. He's a principal architect at Akamai. Uh, Akamai uh, is a leader in the CDN, CDN business. Uh, a lot of the, the internet's traffic goes through, goes through Akamai. Uh, if, uh, you know, if it works well, you don't, you don't know that it's there, but the, the internet just gets, uh, gets faster and, and better. Um, but certainly in, in, uh, a business that, uh, that, that needs to, needs to understand, uh, understand data very well. Uh, thanks for being here today, Mike. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate being here and getting the opportunity to speak with you and everyone else that's watching. Sure. So everybody is talking about DevOps these days, um, but in your mind, what are what are data ops and uh, and why are they important? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, one of the things is, is, as I would say, data ops is certainly a, a newer term that's being used often, and we don't use that particular term as per such at Akamai, we would use more like the standard components that make up the, the data ops. You know, we'll talk about agile, we'll talk about DevOps, we'll talk about how we can make better, more efficient use of our data to make stronger business decisions, more timely business decisions, and more impactful, uh, quicker business decisions. But certainly mm -hmm. it is the concept and it's good that there's a name for the concept. The concept is what it, every business wants, which is how do you make good, fast, effective decisions based on the data you have that's mm -hmm. going to propel your business in a positive direction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there's also kind of a, a, um, a part of that. It's also just about how to how to automate and productionize that so that you know, you're not doing a bunch of um, kind of one-off things, but you can actually build the right the right technical infrastructure to be able to allow you to make those those decisions uh, uh, and on a on a on a reliable uh, a reliable basis. Um, can you can you perhaps describe you know your role as as an architect and you know how how are how are you adopting uh, different data ops practices at uh, at Akamai? Sure. So um, my role is, uh, so as, as Jordan had mentioned, I'm a principal architect at Acme Technologies. I primarily work within our IT systems to work with our back end of gathering all of our network data for our customers to determine how we can calculate our billable statistics. So effectively, you know, all of our customers are, are are doing something on the internet, as Jordan said. Um, data will run through our, our big data collectors, eventually make its way back into our internal systems. And our internal systems job needs to be able to figure out what data belongs to which customer and how do we calculate those statistics so that we can get paid for it, which is the core tenant of any business, right? How do, how do we turn those products into revenue? Um, so effectively, we want to be able to do that. And one of the challenges of, of how we do it is really just there's, a large amount of data that people want all the time as the internet has been growing um, and certainly the pandemic has accelerated that growth by a few years in terms of volume, we're getting larger and larger data to come through. As this data is coming through um, and we need to process it, our business at the same time, because of whether it be competitive, whether the market space, they need to be able to make faster business decisions on how can they know what's happening with a customer? And, and so one of the one of the cool things that we've been able to do, um, certainly just at Akamai with backending our, our data on, on the single store database is effectively running a system to determine all of our traffic for all of our customers within you know a few minutes of that traffic hitting their end. We have a vis we have a visibility that we're able to show out, show all to our internal sales guys, our internal financial guys. Um, and now it, it, this first pass is just an estimate um, because the real data is, the real data just isn't coming in that fast, a full compliant billable data, but it is pretty, very, pretty close and nearly identical to what the eventual billing data becomes. Um, so certainly more directionally accurate and, and even more so I, I'd say nearly um, fully accurate. Uh, and so, a very interesting data ops project was was basically able to turn that into some actionable intelligence and allow 
all of our reps to see what happens whenever there's a big event or something they need for any of their customers. Mm -hmm. um, that, that sounds, sounds awesome that you're, you know, using it, using it to actually, uh, actually understand your bottom line and, um, and, you know, connecting, connecting data to your, to your business. Um, can you perhaps tell me a little bit of how your, you know, just how the infrastructure works or what is your, what is your architecture? Yeah. So um, it, it's interesting. We've, we've tried, we use a few different things. Um, the reality is um, so back ending the final landing place of all this data is, is single store. We're using a presentation simple layer of Grafana on top of it for, for some of this stuff. Now our, our in, internally, we have some homegrown um, basically big data, systems that are ingesting the data, reducing it down before it gets to us. So we have two different paths of data. We have the slow data and the fast data, the Lambda, Lambda type architecture where most people have slow data, fast data. So the, the long tail data, the billing data, um, that's coming in through our big data collection group. Um, but we also have estimators that are out on all of our networks as well. And we're pulling some of that stuff directly with just core um, Python type code where we're ingesting it in we may be processing it sometimes with Kafka or Flink, depending on what we're looking to do. Sometimes we're just taking it and slamming the raw data into the single store database. Uh, it really depends on the exact data set as to, as to what we're doing. Um, but effectively, we're, we're doing all this on, on a large single store cluster. Um, and this same single store cluster is handling our estimate data that's coming in. And that estimate data is coming in, um, you know, a couple hundred million rows every five minutes. Um, and then the, the large data that's coming in as well, our actual billing data is coming in a um, couple billion rows a day. Um, the, the biggest pipelines probably have about 50 to 60 billion rows a day that, that are coming in. So th these are all kind of landing in the same place. Mm -hmm. and, and for a while, they're basically two disparate systems. Um, one of the interesting things that I think we'll talk about in a little bit is, is how we've we've almost brought some of those two together to to even show more power because estimates are great, sales guys love that, but the reality is is financial guys want to know the real numbers, right? They want to know when, when's that mark hit, um, and so we found a way to marry those two together, um, which we'll talk about in a bit. Sure. Um, so, uh, uh, what is, do you have a, do you have an SLA on, on that data? Like the, uh, you know, you said the, the fast data, like, do you need to, you know, do you need to get it within 30 seconds or 10 seconds and, and how I mean, do you we, make sure that you can hit that? Yeah. So, I mean, we, we, we do and we don't, I mean, like, like there's no, because it's, a lot of this is internal. There's no, like, Hey, if you miss the SLA, oh my God. Um, but the reality is, is yes, I will. If I miss the data stops showing up, we'll have an angry person calling our internal per and depending on how important that, angry person is, as most people know, um, depending on who, who the user is, you sometimes get a little bit more uh, heat than others. Um, mm -hmm. But so they are expecting that data within, you know, about five, 10 minutes. Um, and the reality is it just takes that long to collect some of the, some of the estimates and some of the things upstream from us uh, mm -hmm. are really what's blocking us. It's we're loading it in, in, in seconds when we actually get the data. Um, mm -hmm. But getting it from some of the estimates are taking a little bit longer. Our billable data has a little bit more of a long tail to it. So we're looking a couple hours behind. Um, that once again is more about the map reduce type functions that are running upstream from us uh -huh. than necessarily an indication of our capabilities to load the data. Um, we've, one of the, one of the um, reasons why we ended up going with um, single stars on back end is before we were having challenges loading full months of, if we ever hit a problem, a billing, billing runs on a monthly cycle. So you can always reprocess a full month, right? It's a batch process sure. deal. Um, but when we were running in our old systems, this was taking us days and days and we'd fall, we'd have to stop loading for a day to try to catch up a day or two. Um, and it would take us like three or four days minimum to catch up on some of our smaller pipe and not, I shouldn't say smaller, some of our, um, medium to large pipelines, but not our largest pipelines. Mm -hmm. And what we are able to do in single store is basically if we ever fall behind, we can reload a full month in 10, 15 minutes um, to, to basically rerun it there. So we, we were able to really reprocess things well, mm -hmm. um, which helped us out. And so our SLA, I would say, was more about how do we recover? It, it's, it's two different things. Um, Real-time analytics 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, they want to recover it as soon as possible. We're loading it within a few minutes. We're near real time. Um, billing, it's kind of like we want to get our bills out the door like any company as soon as you close that invoice because then it starts down um, you know, the time to getting your cash on hand, which is a whole different account- accounting thing that they want. Um, so that was really a matter of if the month closes and we have an incident around the end of the month, we need to be able to get that resolved immediately. And, and with single store, we've been able to really cut that down massively. Sure. And I think there's, there is an interesting kind of trade-off between sort of batch and batch and real time. And, and, uh, and I think, you know, kind of, uh, it used to be, I think that everything was, everything was batch, uh, you know, and you mentioned sort of map reduce, map reduce style. That was just sort of the way things that, that people, people, you know, do stuff. But, uh, you know, I think as you pointed out, there's some, there's some real drawbacks to that. You know, you, uh, it, it can be hard to, it can be hard to catch up um, or it can be hard to kind of, if you know, if the batch system doesn't run, then your hours out of date, and then you're you can be days out of date. Um, I mean, so what you know, in your in your opinion, what are some of the you know what are some of the trade offs and benefits in sort of in moving towards towards real time, and what are the what are some of the challenges? And I, and I think you you brought up a very good point. So one of the roles of the architect is, is to figure out tra- everything's a trade off. What are mm-hmm. the pros and cons between everything and as you mentioned, everything used to be batch. Everyone was happy with it. Nowadays, if you ask anyone, it sounds like everyone expects everything to be real time. Mm-hmm. The, the reality is, is, is that's, that's not what they, that's what everyone likes. That's not necessarily what everyone really needs. Right. Uh-huh. So, so it's finding the, the sweet spot about what do you really need and how fast do you really need it to accomplish what the business goals are. Um, so, so we've been able to really f- find where we can effectively help our teams by providing some of this data near real time, they can they can notice are we having an issue with a or a, one of our customers' accounts? Mm-hmm. Um, while we, if we're expecting a, a big game download to happen, um, did it actually happen? When it did happen, how high did capacity spike? Did it spike two three x what we we're expecting? In which case, we have a different thing we need to look at. Um, so that, that it's really a matter of figuring out where's that balance and how do we help our 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 business um, have some intelligence into what's happening with the customers to allow ourselves to do that. Right. And I, I mean, that's, that's super interesting. And I think, you know, often the reason that, you know, we people care about data in the first place is because you need to be able to use it to make, to make business decisions, understand, understand your business. Um, you know, what are some of the problems that you guys were, were, were hitting, um, you know, getting insights, getting insights for your data and how, you know, how have you been able to yeah, you know, improve that? Yeah. And so really what, what happened, the, the system that I was talking about, the near real time um, traffic system that we have, one of the challenges that we had before bringing this on and, and really creating this was we had individual pieces of this throughout the company. And, mm-hmm. and, and by that, what I mean is, is if, if someone really important, went to a team, they, they develop a single report for a single customer's code or a single customer's property. And that, and then they'd feed that data through near real time. But what we didn't have was a holistic actual solution that would help 99 plus percent of the company or help for anyone who's not our top two customers or three customers. And, and so it, it really became a matter of when we brought this out, we really provided the visibility of everyone in all of our sales organizations to be able to see how can they view this data near real time and know what their customer was doing. Now, this be, this become, this is more important to some customers, some accounts than others, right? If you're running a, a live streaming event and we, and we do support a lot of major live streaming events out there in the world, um, you need to know what's happening um, for your customer. Inevitably, same thing with large sporting events, uh, really any large live event, You want to know what's happening. Any large download or any large patching, any of those customers of ours who who have those types of um, functions, if you don't have that real near real time visibility, you you end up finding out too late when something's going wrong. Mm -hmm. And and so it's we 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 had a lot of people who really were like, hey, I'm checking this not only to just know where my customers are at, but it's actually helping me in in day to day being able to see where they're going and have conversations with in, you know, even almost use it as a, as a sales tool, even though it's not really not the tool, you know, we weren't, we weren't suggesting anything sales wise that they needed to do. Um, 
but just they'd be able to know by looking at their customers' patterns, what should they be talking to them about? How can they help their customer have a better experience with our overall um, company portfolio by, yeah. by looking at these patterns? So we, we were able to provide some of those near real-time insights by just basically showing the traffic. And since then, we've started to expand to show we can show everything in all geo regions of the world. So if they want to know how a particular customer is doing, how much traffic are they serving in our Europe, Europe versus how much are they start, how much is in England versus how much is in France versus how much is in Germany, you can look at that and split all of our customers out in that way, uh, as well as figure some stuff out. So it, it's actually helped the sales guys. Correspondingly, it also helps our um, capacity planning team for for slightly different reason. They want to know. What about our, our deals with all of our vendors in those countries? Do we have enough pipe? Do we have enough bandwidth in certain areas? Are we getting overloaded in a particular area versus another? So just having that visibility lets you drill down to the next level to say, hey, am I doing the right things in some of my decisions that I'm making my day-to-day job? I mean, that's super interesting. Uh, you know, you kind of mentioned, you know, all these different, all these different regions and as, as a, as a, you know, as a global as a global company and someone who's offering a global service, um, how do you like how do you design your your analytic systems so that you can sort of handle handle the data that comes from you know the the global data, but yet you can kind of make insights you know or or make decisions and un, and understand understand it uh, in a particular location. Yeah, so I mean, we we treat our ingest almost the same, whether it's coming, you know, we have hundreds of thousands of servers out in the world. So eventually we treat that ingest from those servers as the same, no matter whether it's coming from a US server, European server, doesn't matter. Um, but effectively we're getting a piece of information with our with our logging that's telling us, you know, where is the where's this traffic being served from? Um, mm-hmm. Where is it being served to? You know, what, what are the countries or regions of the world, depending on what mapping type things we're using, um, to allow us to know where is that piece of information flowing? And from there, we can tag all of our information with that and, and effectively um, just provide that as an additional piece of our key, which is where we get to tables that have hundreds of billions of records. Um, mm-hmm. you know, our, our tab- some of our bigger tables are a couple terabytes in, in column store per month. Um, mm-hmm. So, and, and we're getting 90 plus percent compression on your, on your column store. Um, so they, these are large, if you had done press them, they're extremely large. Um, so we're getting a lot of, a lot of interesting information that we're able to split out in that way. And then in our, in our case of our um, providing insights to different people, depending on who you are, we give you different visibility to different stuff. So we also are tagging all, enriching all this data with, we're getting a code off of our network, but we're tying that to an actual customer account, right? So we know who the sales reps are for that account. So we let those reps see their particular accounts. Mm-hmm. If you're though a, a you know global services guy who needs to support a bunch of accounts, you're going to see all the accounts you're on as well. Or, or maybe you're the head of finance, we let you see everything. Um, so we, we kind of do a lot of that with, depending on who you are and when, what your approval is, you can see all these pieces of information as well as some of this extra detail about geography and properties and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like you, you know, there's, you, you're operating at very large, very large scale, large tables, large amounts of data. Um, you know, what are, what are some of the challenges with handling, handling that, that data volume? So that, that's an interesting question. There, there a lot of challenges. Um, and, and I mean, one of the, you have challenges the challenge is obviously on the database side of, as to how can you ingest the data? Um, mm-hmm. How are you going to store the data? Are you going to use, so um, single store had a, we, when we started with single store, we were actually, um, we're looking at you guys originally for your in memory um, because that's back when we started with single store was, that was more of what, what you guys were known for really pushing and presenting quickly though. I realized as I'm looking through is that terabytes of data don't fit very well in the RAM. <laughs> And they don't compress very well either. So um, it became a very, very quick conversion from us going, oh, hey, we're going to store this in store a month's worth of data in memory to saying, yeah, this isn't going to work. Um, you know, we need to come up with a column store. And then inevitably, when we did come up with the column store tables, finding the right ways to distribute and shard the data. Um, do you want it to be fast retrieval on a key that you're querying on? Do you want to be able to use the whole system and just equi spread the data across your full distributed system. 
and, and you get different answers depending on what your focus is. Um, in, in our case, we were more focused on ingesting the data and running some big calculations that ran across the full spread of data. So we, we focused on sharding the data equally and spreading it across every node we had as equally as possible without caring to try to retrieve just one customer's data quickly. So we may need to go to every single machine to retrieve one customer's data, but we still get sub-second responses when we go and do that. Um, so it was more important to us to really spread it out because the volume size was our bigger issue um, mm -hmm. in, in ingesting, especially ingesting as I said, when we need to catch up at the end of the month, if we ever have a problem, my biggest issue would be is if we went down and we need to be able to re, re ingest all this data, how fast can I do it? That's, mm -hmm. that, that's where I'm going to hit a problem. Um, and we, and like I said, if we're still seeing sub second query response times, it doesn't matter as much. The other challenge with the big data becomes uh, how do you avoid hash joints? So that, I mean, you guys have worked a lot on your joining, um, but we had to do a lot of tweaking where I realized we wrote some queries that just didn't work very well um, and quickly learned that, hey, if we see some hash joins in, you know, 100 billion row tables, we're not going to work too well, right? So we'll run our, we run our system out of memory. Um, so th there's a lot of, like any performance, I think this, it's a touchy-feely subject, Mm -hmm. um, anyone who does performance tuning knows that there's no one definitive answer. Um, it's just looking through your kind of your checklist of where's my biggest pain point? How do I fix that? And then what's my next pain point after that? Um, even just how do I ingest all this data into my firewall, which has nothing to do with any databases or anything. It's how mm -hmm. my, what kind of network cards do I have? What kind of pipes do I have? And um, things that you may not think of. Um, you know, what do they have at top of rack switches? S simple little things that probably come much after you're thinking about buying your server or ingesting the data or your main firewall. Um, it, it really just all adds up. It's a collection of large amount of stuff. Sure. Uh, so one of the, you know, I think ways to understand a system is to, is if you kind of understand how it breaks, um, it can also be sort of interesting to just sort of hear hear some war stories of of uh, of how things break. So in in your you know in, in your time running you know running running and building this system, like what is what is broken and like how have you learned from that? Yeah, so um, we 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 we've broken a lot. <laughs> to be honest, uh, we we found ways to break break things in new and in, intriguing ways. I've had some interesting conversations with different guys. Um, We've had guys who who ran, you know, create table as select star and just left it running, and it was they did that on our largest table and the, they were thinking, they weren't thinking. Let's just say they weren't thinking, <laughs> and they just left it running overnight. And it's like they were duplicating our largest column store table and like blew out memory in multiple places. Um, you know, we, we've had different little weird operational things. Certainly we've run ourselves out of memory with queries, like I was mentioning, where we're trying to run one of, one of our big queries and one of our big processing queries and probably the one that took the longest time that we were able to get the best eventual returns on was, was we run a, a sort rank for, for what's called, it's a 95, 5 percentile. So old bandwidth throughput as to how, how old ISPs used to always bill which is, you know, you take, you basically take five minute intervals and figure out what, which record falls in the 95th percentile. And that's how you're going to assume that the traffic was. And that's, that's the number you're going to build customers on. And we still have some billing models under this method as well. Um, but it's not an easy way to calculate and sort rank because one of the challenges is, is we have long tail data that keeps coming in. So I can't just keep a big little stack of the top 500 records and pop things off because you know data could come in for yesterday today still because we accept data until the end because like any company if real data comes in for billing as long as the month's not closed or my billing cycle is not closed i'm going to accept that because we want that mm -hmm. revenue um so it, it's an interesting problem and, and we found way you know those that's where the hash joins and some of the problems came in where we we blow memory out of our systems, um, not understanding how to shard data on a distributed system. Um, uh, one of the biggest challenges is we moved over from a traditional RDBMS, right? So you have traditional database developers, they know how to write SQL, 
Mm-hmm. But the way you write effective SQL in a distributed system, and even the way you shard data and tables and doing it, it's, it's very different. And it's not that they're, they couldn't do it. It just, it took a little while. The team has done an absolutely amazing job at what they, what they were able to do, but it took months and months to get that, get up to speed. Um, mm-hmm. You know, now, now that we're up to speed, we're, we're finding everything to be very efficient. We know how to, we know how to run everything, but you know, it, it'd be uh, disingenuous to say, you know, in a month they were up and running. Um, mm-hmm. Because that, that's just not, now if you knew a distributed system and you'd worked a lot more in distributed systems before, it'd probably be a different story. But coming from a non-distributed system background and, and moving to a distributed database, um, it was an eye opener for a lot of the team. Sure. Um, you know, and sometimes when you, when you work with data, like you find, you find things that are surprising. Like if, have you, was there anything that you can, that you can share that you found, you know, as your, uh, um, you know, understanding customer data that, uh, that, that surprised you? Surpri- so surprising that that's an interesting, um, term da- data. No, I mean, I've been at Akamai long enough now that I'm not sure it much surprises me there um, <laughs> these days. Um, but, but certainly, um, it's always interesting to look in, in, since we have the visibility, to be able to see, you know, what exactly is going on? How high are some of these entities peaking at? Mm. What is the most popular thing on the internet that we've seen? Just, mm-hmm. just kind of seeing, you know, what, at a particular time, what is the biggest event out there? And, and mm. it may not be something you're thinking of, um, or you may see the, the traffic may pop for some other random reason. Um, but just having some of those insights and in, in we've also started to be able to feed some of those insights to some of our um, marketing people who are able to look at it and say, hey, this is good information to know, you know, what's happening in this particular vertical. Um, how, how is traffic up or down or, or whatever? It doesn't match their, you know, hypothesis of what they would expect to see. Right. I mean, I imagine you guys just have, you know, a whole lot of insight on on the internet as a whole that that most people don't uh, you know, don't get, um, just, you know, kind of a, a closing question, you know, what, um, you know, for other people that are perhaps experiencing experience data challenges, uh, you know, the size, size, speed, you know, uh, you know, real time, uh, et cetera. Like, do you have any advice for them on, you know, how to, uh, how to overcome those challenges? Well, they, they, there's no simple answer to overcome those challenges, but certainly, I mean, you, you have to you have to size up what it is you're trying to do, and and the real thing is, what is your main goal? So if you want to if you want to deal with a large amount of data, you still need to understand is what of what part of that data do I actually need? Mm-hmm. What part of it do I need to display to other people? What part do I just want to keep around because it's nice to have? What's my duration of data that I need to keep? Um, you know, and, and it really drills into the, what are the characteristics of, of what your application is going to need to do? Um, you know, do you, are you focused on throughput? You, every, everyone's going to say, I want all the above. You know, I want a really fast system. I want it near real time, real time. Um, and, you know, I want it to suddenly just instantly pop up and, and all the data be in front of me and, and there'd be perfect, pretty colorful graphs for it all too. But uh, the reality is there's, there's trade-offs everywhere. Um, we need, you need to know which ones are important to your users, figure out that. And then you have to test out your hypothesis by looking at some of the options out there. So, you know, when you look at your databases, what can they push for throughput? Are they able to handle the ingest that you need? Um, and if they can't, you need to, you, one, you need to, need to say, hey, okay, I'm, I'm okay with that. We're going to run slower than we, we promised. Or you have to say, hey, I need someone who can handle this throughput. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really the same on all the components is you need to look at and say, what is my main goal? What are the technologies out there? Also, what is my team capable of? Uh, I mean, people don't like to say that statement, especially on the architecture side, but the reality is right, we, have, we all have a team of developers here and, and they're good at certain things and they're not good at other things. And if you try to force them to be good at something they're not good at, you're probably not going to end up with a good product. Um, so knowing your team's strengths and knowing where you need to supplement that team strength is also an extremely important. And that is definitely one of the more important dev data ops type things. If, if your developers aren't good with you business users, you don't want them being the ones talking to the business users agilely and doing iterative development. You want to put someone who, or you want to teach them and train them how to do that. Right. Sure. Um, 
I think that's uh, that, that's super interesting. Um, Mike, thank you so much. It's been been really great talking to you. Uh, you know, all the best with uh, with with uh, you know with your your data ops journey, and uh, and thanks for your time. Thank you, Jordan. Pleasure talking to you.